Now I'd like to move to our first in invited speaker. Um, we're absolutely delighted uh, to have um, Patricia Gouveia from the Interactive Technologies Institute and FBAUL, Lisbon University in Portugal. Um, her, the title of her talk is Interactive Multimedia Experiences in Higher Education, Gaming, Augmented and Virtual Reality and Research. And just to introduce um, Patricia, she is an Associate Professor at Lisbon University Fine, Art, Fine Arts uh, Faculty, an integrated member of the Interactive Technologies Institute and Laboratory for Robotics and Engineering Systems. She has been the co-curator of the Play Mode exhibition and works in multimedia arts and design um, since the 90s, where her research has focused on playable media, interactive fiction and digital arts as a place of convergence between cinema, music, games, arts and design. Previously, she's held multiple positions across uh, different organisations as Associate Professor at the Interactive uh, Media, Games and Animation at Norroth University College in Norway, as Invited Assistant Professor um, and Assistant Professor in Lisbon, and has edited the blog Mouseland and also published a book on digital arts and games, uh, aesthetic and design of ludic experience. And that was a synthesis of her doctoral thesis and also some articles that she's published. So we're absolutely delighted to have you with us, Patricia. Over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm not seeing myself, but everything is proper. Can you hear me well? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Um, first of all, I should thank the, um, the invitation, but also our Portuguese National Scientific Foundation and uh, Maria João Sequeira in particular uh, for all her guidance during the workshop preparation and the presentation of today. Uh, I will tell you today about my own story. I'll tell you the story of my the last five years at uh, Lisbon University. Uh, as a art, multimedia art department director for three years and a half, and the last one year and a half at the research center where we start. I started. Tell, I will tell you also a collaborative story with my students uh, uh, doing research in um, interactive media and digital gaming in Portugal, and uh, with a group of students that I will uh, explain uh, and show their work and their projects afterwards. But I, I started with uh, four main questions. How do think, to think about the digital transition in terms of open source and non-commercial technology, something to think in future because we are now these days teaching since last year uh, settled in Zoom, but maybe it's not the best. And our students are also using Discord, which is an alternative. Another question could be how to use digital technologies to enhance human emancipation and participation, because I think, uh, as you will see, there's a divide in technical or engin the engineering faculty in Lisbon and uh, fine arts faculty. So I have mainly uh, uh, women and they have mainly uh, men. So that's a, there's a problem. Uh, and how third question, how to engage women from several countries in a shared project based research environment? We have students from uh, different countries, European countries, but also from Brazil this year from other several uh, continents. How to use arts-based research to promote uh, women, inclusion and digital literacy would be my next uh, last question. I'll show concrete experience that we did during these five years uh, using gaming and interactive media in our education environments. And uh, last year it was very important for us and I'll explain why. Participation design frameworks um, using tradition uh, of critical uh, tradition of critical and interdisciplinary studies in humanities, but also uh, the, what we call these days uh, digital humanities uh, could help shape these strategies enhanced by the cooperation uh, with three faculties, which is the fine arts faculty, the geography uh, faculty, and the engineering faculty uh, that I will uh, show. Uh, and it was like collaborations that we put in place during the last years. 
the aim of these experiments was uh, to uh, enhance our mental potential for innovation and research, taking, taking advantage, advantage of gaming research methodologies, and uh, we were all learning together. This morning, uh, we were speaking about bottom-up uh, methodologies that what we used, we were all um, uh, researching in an exploratory way with students by our side. So we were all together in these types of experiences to help students achieve their goals. Uh, and as I used to, because I, I arrived at the university in a late stage of my uh, life, so I was working previously as a freelancer in uh, the cultural set sector. This presentation also shows research done in interactive media, augmented reality and virtual reality, and game art and gender equity. And um, the collaborations that we we put in place like several years ago uh, in 2020 were really important because we uh, had the chance of going to the online mode with a, a more uh, with more uh, a more uh, easy way. These are the three faculties. The engineering faculty, for you to have one idea, it's uh, 10 times uh, bigger than the fine arts faculty, and EGOT is even shorter than the fine arts faculty, but together we could uh, merge our forces. And uh, in our faculty also, during the, the, the first three years uh, that I, I, I was working there, we did a, a curricular reform uh, of all the three cycles, the bachelor, the, the master, and the, the, the doctoral uh, study cycle in multimedia art. And all the faculty did the same to open the, the, the degrees uh, to other areas. I think in my, because I studied in this faculty a long time ago, and at that time, things were a lot more together. We were more to get more connected with design studies, industrial and communication design, and then everything was very separated. And uh, what we want uh, to do three years ago was to, in a way, go forward and at the same time to go back, to connect with tradition, but uh, to open uh, the old all departments to a more collaborative way with optional courses for students and so on. So we also collaborate with museums in Lisbon, the, those for play mode, the, the Museum of Fire Technology and uh, Architectural in Lisbon, MAT, and also Faraday Museum from one of our technical universities where students could collaborate with curators there or in Faraday Museum or at, uh, to be able to see uh, artists from abroad, 30 artists in exhibitions elsewhere. We also did a partnership with the French uh, school and the German university, STN Paris and Maine University. And now I, I will show some images of what I've been talking about. Uh, my research group now counts normally uh, each year uh, since one year uh, and a half ago with one psychologist from Brazil. She's also a researcher and a postdoctoral candidate, uh, Dr. Luciana Lima. Six doctoral candidates, Anna Unterholzer from Germany, Isabel Arvers from France, and Terry Martila from Finland. But also Portuguese students, of course, in this case, Diana Carvalho and uh, Dr. F Teresa Furtado, because she has another PhD in uh, sociology and she is doing a second PhD in fine arts. And Tiago Mindrico, uh, uh, these are our um, doctoral students and we count each year uh, around eight, eight, eight master students like three are uh, going uh, to finish this year but uh, we have uh, more three coming up so uh, normally it, it has uh, this is the number that we uh, tend to have each uh, year so this is the group of research that i'm trying to mobilize for the the, the last uh, one year and a half and uh, the good news from last year that I had uh, uh, this student, uh, she was working, Andrea Batista, she was working in her master thesis about how to use gaming and uh, effective computing to uh, create a game about using emotions and uh, a gaming experience. And then uh, she was uh, invited because she was uh, really uh, um, 
active student. She was invited to go and to join uh, the research group from the, our geography faculty because she could contribute in an applied way uh, with her knowledge, her design knowledge to the, 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 the group, to the research of uh, Professor Margarida Queiroz uh, at Higot. And it was a very um, good experience, I think, for both uh, universities. And also Tiago Mendrico, he was doing his master, he's now uh, in our PhD, uh, working in these areas of ludification, critical play, game studies, uh, but use, he was uh, using as his city, Almeida, as a case study to create a game experience about mobility. And uh, he's now in his PhD, but also working because it's important for us that our students could connect with other types of methodologies because art based research is very open and uh, it's always we are known by doing the weird connections and to be very creative. But sometimes it's useful for them to have different types of research methodologies that they can earn, uh, like collaborating as uh, in their own fields. So Tiago is now in charge of the collaboration, uh, the communication communication um, area in this project from Professor Margarida Queiroz. But also another student in this case is in the engineering master and he was uh, able to collaborate with the uh, fine arts uh, students, one for the, the um, he was doing um, augmented reality uh, experiences for um, museum pieces the Bell uh, telephone in this case, it's just a prototype here. And um, he was able uh, to collaborate with one art student uh, to do the 3D job, 3D area art job, and another student for uh, from the fine art faculty uh, to create animations in an in, uh, interface, in the, uh, design interface, interfaces. And I was working in uh, with a teacher out there. So uh, five years ago, when we start doing these collaborations with the engineer faculty, um, we knew that there were a demand, uh, students were demanding to have uh, more game studies into their curricular and in my case I was also um, helping with my colleagues to redesign uh, our um, three uh, cycles, our degrees, so um, it was for us um, clear that we should uh, look at this um, trend disciplinary approach that uh, uh, working in gaming and in as critical thinking uh, to to make people collaborate with other areas and that's uh, is part of the the skill set for the 21st century the acquisition of communication skills and teamwork capabilities soft skills merged with knowledge from various fields i also um, knew that uh, there were a report from USA universities and college that uh, instigates educators to promote an integration of disciplines to avoid uh, what I called in a chapter that I published last year, the specialization disease. So people really need to connect, really need to think that uh, for our case, we won't be like the, the um, a kind of myth of programming because we are artists and we have a bunch of software that we should learn and we cannot know everything, but we can collaborate with other people to uh, achieve better and more sophisticated goals. Arts and design interplay, this idea that we can create problems and then try to solve problems, arts uh, with two uh, types of, uh, um, uh, of possibilities, problem-based learning and project-based learning, create and solve project uh, uh, problems, uh, merging arts and design. These are our initiatives. If you see the majority of girls, I think only one girl, it's not from the fine arts faculty and you can see the, the boys are only uh, two boys are from the fine arts faculty. So here you can see immediately that there's a divide in both faculties. And um, in, during one semester for, this is the fifth year, for um, these years, uh, our students, it involves around 50 to 60 uh, engineers, uh, students, and um, 15 to 20 uh, artists. So they collaborate to create a prototype for uh, an exhibition. It's all every year at the end of May, the last week of May, and they present, uh, they have public presentations in this uh, uh, initiative. You can uh, have, see, I will let you the blog, um, link that where you could uh, research their journals they have like they need to to write a post for their blogs each uh, 15 days 
and they collaborate together in the center of this image you have like an Erasmus student from Italy and the, the, the second girl is a Portuguese one and um, many students in these uh, collaborate in these initiatives and then they show their prototypes uh, in a shared environment uh, sometimes there are uh, uh, like TV um, coverage or um, yes, uh, high schools coming to the, the, the setting and it was since 2017, 2018, then 19 and in 2020 uh, we uh, jumped into one, an online initiative which went really well because if uh, it, it's not the same, of course, it's different uh, if we had the chance that companies came to see also their projects and the interaction and, and in campus was a lot more interesting. The, the initiative online from last year was also interesting because they had like master and PhD students doing interviews to other students and mentoring uh, group presentations and creating a very uh, one day long uh, dynamic to the whole group. One of our doctoral students from Germany, Anna Unterholzner, had a great job also last uh, since 2019 when she arrived at our faculty and she uh, did an amazing job of connecting with the engineering department and with the, the doctoral the, uh, the engineering students, doctoral students, and they create uh, several initiatives to uh, promote the value of games in higher education. Here you can see that she's alone with uh, um, different um, engineers, male again, and uh, in the, uh, the, the, right, the left uh, picture you can see uh, that other master students from our faculty uh, were uh, feeling that they have a representative from our faculty uh, among them, which is uh, better for them to feel more comfortable. So uh, Anna also was uh, working uh, in several projects and in a club for students. Uh, which opened um, last year in September. So they were recruiting students uh, and um, helping uh, like in uh, global game jams here. She was collaborating with three other uh, students, uh, master students from uh, our fine arts faculty. She was creating also imagery for the, the initiative. As you will see at the end, I have a video. You can see that the um, the logo was totally different uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it is much better. Uh, it's better. Um, at the end of, uh, at, at the, on the middle of uh, last year, um, but at the end they won a prize in these uh, my students, my two master students, Andrea Batista, I show her work previously, and Ariana started working uh, about um, uh, domestic violence as a research, uh, part of a research master thesis. And they created a game together because uh, they were both in these initiatives with the technical school. They created together uh, this game and uh, with uh, an engineer from the, the, the engineering faculty and the, the game will come, uh, will be released in June 2021. It was, I was very happy to see that they were completely emancipated to create a, a project by themselves. Uh, so I think the, 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 these initiatives were um, prolific and uh, I was happy about it. At the same time, we created workshops with um, other universities. In this case, was a university on, uh, in Paris. And uh, we developed uh, two types of workshop. In one case, we were working uh, in our faculty in Lisbon. Four teachers from Paris came with 30 students, French students. And uh, in Paris, I went uh, with, uh, the, we were two teachers and one uh, doctoral uh, student, Terry Martilla. Uh, to, to do the workshop for the French students and we um, went with our students as well. So you can see also the blogs and all the week, uh, all the week it was one week in Lisbon and one week in Paris. And the Paris uh, school was very generous because the, the, uh, the French students hosted our students because it was it is very expensive live in Paris. So we were able to give them uh, to be the, the possibility of uh, being hosted and also uh, lunch was uh, part of the, the agreement with the French school and here you can see images of all the groups so we were together during one week and then uh, we presented at the beginning were the teachers and at the end was uh, at our auditorium the, st the students were presenting their work 
Another case is with Mainz University. So some uh, German students came to Lisbon and then we went to, and that was organized by one of my colleagues and um, uh, Professor Antonio Sousa Dias with uh, another uh, teacher from Mainz University, which happens to be a Portuguese teacher. So in both cases, we had like uh, someone uh, from the outside university who, who knew very well how things are in Portugal and it facilitates a lot because it was there is this complicity that they knew the, the different realities in both countries. So it helped, definitely. Uh, as I told you, I'm telling a story which is also my story, but also a collective story with all my colleagues and all the, the, the other uh, groups from other faculties. And uh, I'm showing um, it all started in 2016 also with Terry Martilla because she's uh, living, she came to, to Portugal to live and she started uh, her PhD uh, in uh, Oporto University faculty. And then I, I, I become a supervisor in terms of the artistical project. And she's also has, she also has a supervisor in, in the engineering department. So we created last year also again online. Everything was online and with, um, we did this residency with an interaction designer and uh, we were working together to um, uh, put this uh, work in an exhibition in uh, the end of December and beginning of February meant to be online all the time. So the, the, the artwork would be presented online. But also in our group, we have uh, Teresa Furtado from Evora University, another research um, group, and she's uh, doing uh, research with women in shelters and she's creating um, tools for them to create their artworks. And then she, she will present it and she's presenting uh, their artworks in this uh, website. She's developing it yet, but uh, it's an ongoing project for a PhD in fine arts and uh, in, it involves, uh, she was also uh, doing exhibitions exhibitions in Lisbon in the Chiado Museum, which is nearby our faculty, so she works in gender uh, for uh, some time now. Um, trying to answer my questions, do-it-yourself mixed with do-it-together strategies can help people use more complex digital tools. It will be my answer. Group arts-based research projects can help human develop digital compet competencies. Creating conditions for human participation in a shared environment, avoiding ghettos. I always try to have men among us. We have an Italian student. Uh, this year we'll have a Brazilian student. Not to be uh, like in a women ghetto. Interdisciplinary workshops and formal and informal meetings. Uh, merging arts and engineering could be instrumental. Artists can collaborate with engineers besides doing other things besides programming. And Discord uh, would be uh, maybe useful to look at. Uh, it's coming from gaming communities and maybe it's a, a useful tool. It's an open source uh, tool. An arts-based research approach can be instrumental to other areas besides higher education, as in itself, much a capacity to create and identify projects, uh, problems, sorry, artistical skills with a design approach, design skills, to solve them, um, to solve, so to, to merge artistical skills with design skills can solve um, some questions that we are living and it can generate a critical deba debate in an exploratory uh, methodology to uh, try to find solutions. As Picasso once said, uh, when he works in arts, he's, not, he's doing research uh, as uh, his basic um, work. So the idea of merging two types of methodologies from um, social sciences in our group, I, I have Teresa Furtado from, uh, she has a PhD in sociology, but also Luciana Lima, she has a, a, a doctoral thesis in psychology, but she's a psychologist as well. And they help a lot. We were speaking about it because I also did my PhD in communication sciences. So I'll, we can enhance arts based research with all these different approaches like collaborating but not to try to erase uh, any uh, approach so with Luciana Lima she's doing an amazing job um, exploring um, and interviewing women in the digital game sector in Lisbon and um, uh, it trying to uh, make a proper um, database of research saying that we still have a problem in terms of uh, 
uh, of uh, thinking about uh, gaming as a, a software um, system and not as a cultural problem or a, a software artifact and not as a cultural artifact. And uh, in that case, we really need to, to enhance uh, this approach because I think uh, in terms of research and using research for the gaming, indie gaming, arts gaming, arts games, and uh, so on, it's important to, to, to have more voices and open the, the environment. For uh, also, Luciana Lima was researching and doing interviews with women uh, during uh, last year pandemic. And um, she was uh, also working with Camila Pinto uh, and in, uh, in uh, a couple of interviews with uh, several people uh, during the, the last months. Uh, and uh, what they found is like women were a uh, lot for them was easier to, to become uh, to work online and um, they were facing some challenges in terms of domestic environment and um, they were gaining time in one area and they were losing time in another. And, um, but uh, our, uh, we will publish a paper uh, in a couple of months or so about this issue. And we can speak it a little bit more afterwards. Um, that's what I'm trying to vision. It's a more sustainable future for younger generations. All day we work together uh, to create inclusion in a very con concrete context, such as the case of recent mothers who can participate in conferences, festivals and other events without all the related logistics concerning breastfeeding. Disabled people who have restricted mobility, you can assess and follow remote classes without constraints because I'm always hearing the bad side of uh, the dark side of the social networks and all these um, uh, bad things that we tend to, to discuss these, these, uh, recently and we forgot the last 30 years how things change. So access to international events and research networks in peripheral countries such as Portugal is essential to solve gender asymmetries and others. The dialogue with the North enhanced through informal connections, which allows to dismantle Biaz's ideological, ideological instrumentalization in educational contents. So I think uh, um, as a, a, a type of conclusion, I would say, uh, an arts-based research approach with no predetermined ideas or concepts, a bottom-up or an open box uh, methodology where participants or players can engage in a fictional world that creates empathy and affection for others, for strangers, for those we cannot understand. Participation and cooperation mediated by media can enhance civic engagement. The internet is now a mass medium and unlike the real world, it is border borderless. Digital media platforms and are instrumental to stimulate team projects with different geographical locations, enhancing dialogue outside geographic boundaries. The internet facilitates dialogues instead of speeches. Those who only emphasize hate speech forget, uh, forget, forget the achievements of the last 30 years. That's what I was saying. I don't know how I am in terms of time to be, because I'm totally... Yeah, yeah. I it probably, probably yes yeah, thank you very much Patricia it, it's very interesting to hear about your research and particularly the gender dimension and the interaction of art with digitalization and that transdisciplinary approach which I think is really innovative your COVID findings are very interesting as well and particularly gaining time in one area but then losing it in another. So um, we we have time maybe for one or two questions. Um, so if anybody wants to write a question in the chat, please do. If you want to uh, raise your hand, I can call on you to ask a specific question. Um, I have one to start, um, if, if that's okay. And you had mentioned, how can we use the digital technologies to enhance women participation and specifically you were talking about the group arts-based projects that can help women develop digital competencies and just to explore that a little bit more is that something really just from a lifelong learning and the research or is that something we should be thinking about for schools yes i think it's a lifelong learning because i use my own experience and sometimes so when i guide my students i i was telling them that 
we take for granted some uh, millennium knowledge of digital tools. And when we started working, if they don't have a project, uh, because I was learning the, all the software packages with my own projects. So I could appreciate uh, how we can enhance these skills when we have a goal, like I have to uh, to create something for a client or for uh, someone. And I think it's uh, it enhances the, the, the capacities of using these softwares, image 3D softwares, like uh, there are a, a huge amount of video softwares and so on. So I think it's a live learning uh, progression. <laughs> Very good. And and then from a member state's point of view, so all the countries that have joined us and will be reading this material, what from your point of view is the main recommendation for them from a transdisciplinary approach? Is it to be brave and to, to take that and involve it in their science strategies that they're developing? Yes, to be aware of having uh, several uh, fields, not only like engineering, because I think the approach with programming, it's uh, very particular because there are women we don't really want to get involved in programming and they can collaborate. That's the, the, the research that uh, we come up uh, recently. It was a lot more on that. I criticized a lot our approach in terms of uh, almost it's a men's club that I, I as myself, I, I, I felt out uh, of the club because I was I, I think things got worse recently, to be honest, for the last 10 years than when I was working in multimedia in the 90s, because I was very well welcome uh, among engineers at that time. And uh, I, I and that was why I, I developed these partnerships, because I was telling my students, you can gain in, in these par partnerships because engineers will have a job and then when they think they need someone from the art world, they will contact you and they will, uh, it will be needed. So uh, you will have your network as well in different faculties. So I think it was by my own uh, experience uh, and uh, very good. No, that, that's really good advice. We could keep talking about this all day. I'm, I'm conscious of time, but thank you very much, Patricia. Thank we you. really value the um, opportunity to, to um, hear your insights. And also thank you for taking the time to join us today. So thank you. That's brilliant. So we'll move now to our next invited speaker. Um, and I'm delighted um, to introduce uh, Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan. Um, she is the principal investigator uh, of the STEM Passport for Inclusion at Maynooth University in Ireland. Um, so her title is, We Are Not All the Same, and Considering the Interaction Between Class and Gender and Participation in the Digital World very much speaking uh, to our intersectionality piece. So Katrina lectures in digital skills in the Assisting Living and Learning Institute, the All Institute, at the Department of Psychology in Maynooth University. She is the research lead with Microsoft Ireland Dream Space, and she holds research grants from the Irish Research Council and Science Foundation Ireland to examine issues relating to equality and equity in access to education. She's the principal investigator for the STEM Passport for Inclusion project, and she's creating a digital platform which supports working class girls to access STEM courses in universities and STEM careers. The Passport is being developed in partnership with Microsoft Ireland and Accenture and is funded by Science Foundation Ireland. Katrina was also a research fellow at Trinity College Dublin and in partnership with Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford, where she developed the program of research which informed and evaluated the impact of the first foundation year in Oxford University. She was an invited speaker at the World Education Forum in January 2019, and her work has focused on straddling research and practice, developing papers and practices in areas related to equity and access to high status professions. 
and more recently, the focus on gender equality during the COVID-19 pandemic. So many thanks, Katrina. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this today. I was a little bit nervous um, because I am really, I'm really excited about the fact that gender is being considered alongside digitization. And also, I have sometimes as a associate professor or as a female in this type of world, I have uh, imposter syndrome. <laughs> And I think it's one of the thing, reasons why I work in this area is because I, I'm really passionate about trying to challenge, challenge um, society to think differently about human potential. So I'm just going to begin. Um, I, hopefully we all are aware of the leaky pipeline, the idea that women, well, not the idea, the fact is that women are more likely to, well, are less likely to participate in science, technology, engineering and maths careers and even if they do there are particular points or junctures within that pipeline where they are likely to fall out or not progress in the same way that men do so in engineering we we can see that young girls don't aspire for to engineering they then don't take the courses available to them and we see in IT when looking at management structures there's particular junctions within uh, the system as it stands, where, where women are more likely to drop out of the system. So there's leaks in the pipeline. And this is across the board. So engineering, uh, technology, uh, physics, math, biology, research, innovation, women are underrepresented and more li less likely to progress into high status positions. So hopefully we're all aware of that. So for me, um, my particular uh, focus today we'll be talking about why well we'll be discussing how I suppose we're not all the same and all, all women are not the same and we need to consider that when we're developing policies practices and um, programs everything uh, that is aimed at um, increasing participation my focus today will be looking particularly at um, young women and the passport for STEM uh, the STEM Passport for Inclusion that I, I'll introduce you to is particularly interesting is how we can uh, support working class girls or young women from lower class communities to ensure they are prepared and informed about the potential of the digital workforce. So first of all, what is intersectionality? So I'm just going to tell you a little bit of st a story. I, I mentor actively in schools and I go into communities of disadvantage as much as possible to try to spread the message that it's possible to be anything that you want to be. And recently I was in a, a school in, in Dublin um, and it, it is a very disadvantaged school in terms of uh, wealth and uh, knowledge of education or alternative careers. And I was talking to the young women who are really bright and enthusiastic and have so much potential. I was talking to them about the leaky pipeline and saying to them, you know, uh, women leave their careers because they have babies. Women are, you know, girls don't go into science careers because they don't have role models. And the 15 year old girl, she put her hand up and she said, Miss, I said, I'm not Miss, but I'm not the teacher, but she's like, uh, she said, I, I don't agree. Like, we're not all the same. And I was taken aback. Um, I actually know that we're not all the same, but I was actually um, delighted that this young woman was able to see this. And she said, I, I, I don't take, I don't want to do science because we don't have science available to us in our school. And it just got me, I think it's a good way of introducing this idea of intersectionality. Um, the idea that all women are the same and we face the same challenges when considering participation in the digital world is just a flawed idea. And if we continue, if we don't take into account the fact that race, uh, class, disability or ability status intersect, um, we are actually doing a disservice to women. So in terms of the background then of intersectionality, Crenshaw was the first person to talk about it. Um, and Crenshaw talked about the, the intersection between uh, race and sexism. So intersectionality is actually where social categories um, intersect and create a, un a unique experience. 
Um, my work has been particularly focused on class and gender, and I'll explain why in the next slide. But just to give you the definition, I suppose, of class for me, because when I do talks like this, some people are really uncomfortable with the idea of talking about social class, um, especially in Ireland. It's, it's as if it doesn't exist there. It exists everywhere. Um, but class, in terms of our, the definition that I would use, is this, a system of order within society where people are divided into different sets based on their social and economic wealth. And so their economic wealth, obviously, is their financial capability, but their social wealth is their knowledge about and values around education and, and employment and how they use that to get ahead. Um, and then, of course, gender. Gender is the um, sex-based social structures that are placed on males and females or the gender identities um, that are ascri ascribed to us based on our sex. So um, I was really trying to find a way to introduce intersectionality. I was looking for graphics. I like to be creative in my presentations and rather than just text. And I, I actually found when I was looking for particular graphics that anything that I would present would actually uh, reinforce stereotypes. And that's not what I'm here for. So I decided to actually go to a couple of women. Hopefully some of you met Amy today, but uh, I went to a few women that I know and asked them, could I talk about their story to just give you an example of how different social uh, structures or identities can impact upon the progression of women into becoming a scientist. So these three women here are all scientists. Um, first of all, we have Amy Bowen. So Amy is a woman. She works for Accenture. She, she's a senior manager in Accenture. Now, Amy would have, um, would have the challenge of being a female who is working in science, um, like all females do. But Amy, that in, in terms of her journey into her, into her job, that really is the only challenge that she would have faced. Um, Amy herself would say to you, she's middle class. She, her mother was a scientist and her father was a teacher. And, and she uh, would openly say that um, it was completely expected of her to go to university. So when we're thinking about um, providing policies or practices that are gonna empower women to choose to participate in the digital world, Amy really needs support primarily around her um, her capacity to her, around her gender and the challenges that she may face because she's a female. For example, Amy studied computer science. She was there was only three women in her course. They, they were all males. She never knew anybody who had graduated from computer science. So realistically, Amy really did need to uh, observe the profession and know more about the professions. I'm going to move on to me, myself. So I would be what you would call, uh, I come from a very less than working class background. So the underclasses. I had no one in my family who went to university. I, I, literally no one finished school in my family. My parents were involved in criminality and we didn't read books in the house. And so my journey, um, I left school at 15 without actually qualifications. So any intervention that would have been developed for me in terms of trying to get me to aspire to be a scientist, as I am, as successful as I am today, really is different to what Amy would have to experience or, um, or, or need. For me, my journey, I actually went to university as a mature student. I, I did it through an access program. I was supported financially. I had charities that had supported me. There were policies that were in place in our government, by our government, that were about widening participation that I was able to avail of. So my experience was completely different to Amy's and my needs were different. And then I'll move you to Jelly May. Jelly May is an undergraduate, a science undergrad in Maynooth University. Jelly May migrated from, to Ireland due to extreme poverty. She attended a really disadvantaged school and has experienced significant financial struggles, but is also an ethnic minority in Ireland, which is an added challenge for her in terms of having a role model, having access to finances, um, and in terms of her ethnic 
uh, or her culture, she has expectations on her that are placed in her by her families that differ to mine and actually different to to Amy. So in terms of intersectionality, we are all very successful women, very successful scientists who are availing of the digital movement, the tech revolution. However, what was needed for us to be successful was completely different. Um, and I like this comment at the bottom, uh, which says genius is evenly distributed by class, race and gender. However, opportunity and access are not. So in terms of Ireland, then in Ireland, I'm working closely to try to um, shift young women's young working class women's opportunity in terms of um, STEM and taking part in the uh, digital workforce. So we have uh, the gender STEM gap. It's well documented. Less women are taking um, engineering and computer science courses year on year. But in Ireland, we're unique in the sense that we are the digital hub um, for Europe. We, at, as it stands today, we have 8,000 jobs that are currently unfilled. So it's imperative for, for us to actually think about, not just from a, a fairness and an equity point of view, but encouraging diversity and participation of women who intersect in, in, terms, of, in terms of class and gender is also paramount for our economic success. We need to learn how to empower women to participate well in the, the future of our, our workforce. And when we consider, when we look at um, class and gender, this divides, the gender gap actually in STEM actually widens. So working class girls are less likely to take higher level science courses in school. They are less likely to apply to STEM degree courses. Even if they do apply and attend, 30% of working class female students leave without their degree. This is twice as many as middle class girls. And then working class women are rarely seen in science and technology and engineering or uh, math professions. Um, they're more likely to be seen in caring roles. And even more so, we lack representation in leadership, leadership positions, working class women in Ireland. And so the problem with this is that without intervention, working class women are more at risk in terms of um, not being able to participate in the digital world. Now this includes not having their data represented in the development of algorithms and their de development of AI, but also not being able to take advantage of the 21st century job market and all that that brings to society. So what will happen if we do not develop interventions that are that consider intersectionality, what we'll end up doing is ensuring that working class women stay entrenched in poverty. And that will be through a lack of STEM opportunities. My work recently has looked at the she session, the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, job losses for women, which has actually magnified this issue, showing that working class women are the most at risk at the moment of losing their jobs because they're actually over concentrated in low skilled social care roles. So providing working class women with the opportunity to move out of low skilled, low paid and low potential jobs will actually increase social mobility, it'll contribute to overall wellbeing, but also provide solutions to the talent crisis that we're, we're in at the moment. So from a theoretical point of view. I just want to um, uh, introduce you to, so I suppose, the, the academic model that I use that I use in, in, my, in my work around uh, equity and access to understand where we need to intervene in order to ensure specific groups are empowered um, in modern society. So I use um, a, a capital, a human capital and human capabilities theoretical framework to try to understand what what it is that is deficit in our current societal structures that acts as barriers for particular women and women from particular groups. Now, when I say deficit, I, I refer to deficit in our societal structures rather than deficit in the women that I'm talking about, because each woman has the potential, equal potential to be as successful as the other. And it's the structures that are letting them down rather than 
their individual selves. So what I do, what I've done is taken, the, I suppose, a capital lens and identified um, some key areas where we, where working class girls are, are, are particularly, are not actually receiving um, support in order for them to gain or garner STEM capital. So firstly, in the Irish context, what we have is, uh, we have minimum matriculation requirements for our university entry. And also we have optional, uh, it's, uh, science subjects are optional for, for uh, our final year exams. And what we find in the Irish context is, um, science subjects are not always offered to working class girls. So we know across agenda, um, that girls don't always take science subjects. But what we have in Ireland is a situation where there's particular schools that don't actually offer science subjects. So we have large cohorts of, of young women who are in disadvantaged communities who are not even given the opportunity to matriculate and enter university or study STEM. The, so what we have in terms of human capital is we definitely have a, a science and a digital skills a deficit where young women are not actually gaining the science skills to be able to move into and meet the entry requirements for science courses and science careers. The other issue that we have is that young women uh, from disadvantaged or working class backgrounds don't actually have access or finances for extracurricular activities that may support them to understand or explore different professions. So I have a little tick here by Amy and a two crosses by myself and Jelly May, because I know from experience that Amy would have actually, she would have studied all the science subjects in school. She would have gone to a coding club. She would have had computers in her home. She would have had all of these um, opportunities to explore the different uh, careers. Whereas myself and Jelly May were really restricted in terms of our education experience. The other then, when you turn to cultural capital, this is a little bit more difficult to intervene with, but it needs to be named. Often the family that we come from will actually provide us with our, our cultural, our, the dark arts is what I like to call it. So um, cultural capital, it comes in things like values and beliefs around education and employment within your home, but also within your community. So if we look at working class girls, we look at girls in general, science and um, technology isn't the norm for, for women, but it's it's less of a norm for working class girls than it is for just women in general. So as I said, it's the women who do generally succeed in these environments are those who have the cultural capital to navigate the dark arts of university, of the careers. So they may face challenges as females, but then challenges are completely different when you add class and wealth to that dynamic. Finally, the, the, the last thing that's really important is social capital. And I think all women who are facing or considering uh, a future career in technology, in science and math, they, we all lack um, role models in some sense or another, or identifiable role models. So one thing that's really important if you're trying to empower someone who is underrepresented in a particular profession or course is providing them with an identifiable role model. And what that identifiable means is that, that they share a history that they can relate on. It's the same as if, you know, that same old, if you can do it, I can do it. So young women particularly need to need to see people like themselves within the science environments. So these are, I suppose, the three areas that we know are particularly challenging um, and intersection for our intersectional um, for young working class women in terms of getting them to consider science and technology and engineering and maths for a career. So that's the theoretical framework that I work from. And I just want to move a little bit on then to, I suppose, <laughs> what can we do better? So I'm all for the solution. I've published papers in lots of areas, but sometimes I, I find publishing sometimes into a black space quite frustrating. Like for me, academia should be translatable into possibilities for, for mankind. And it is. It, I'm not saying that it isn't. 
but I, I, I'm lucky enough to be able to work closely and innovatively to try to develop interventions based on the research that I am doing. And so there's one question that we have all been asking ourselves around working class girls in Ireland is what can we do better? So I'm just going to give you a quick whistle stop tour of the STEM passport. I have four minutes left, I think, uh, or maybe I've gone over. So I'm going to give you a quick whistle stop tour about what we're doing. So basically, the STEM passport for inclusion is a systemic approach to trying to empower working class women to consider science and technology and engineering and math as a meaningful career or course for them in the future. And the approach that I've taken to this and we've taken as a group isn't to develop another on the ground intervention that because there's loads and loads of great work going on. What we've done is taken a systemic approach to this and said, how can we meaningfully move young women through the system and build a program that can be taken by our nation and applied to all young women? So the first thing that we've done is we've we've built a partnership. So industry education and science foundation island have come together i suppose to try to meaningfully engage with a thousand young women from working class communities over the next year in ireland to empower them to see technology as something that they can um, engage in so we're working closely with microsoft and accenture and we've uh, two universities in ireland who are a partner and then science foundation have provided us with a grant for this program so how are we doing it? The first thing that we're doing is we are basically we're we are go we're not reinventing the wheel. We're actually we're actually taking existing STEM skill programs that are all over the country and we're linking them with universities and we're providing young women from working class communities with a accredited pathway into the university. So what we're doing is we're going out all over Ireland, we're taking an inventory of what's going on and we're asking people who are offering science and technology uh, trainings for young people to actually link with the university and asking that university to recognise that that activity as entry to a, a science degree in the university. So in Maynooth what we're doing is we're working with Microsoft who have a program called DreamSpace we're providing that that um, dream space with a five, uh, a level six credit, and the university is going to say if the young woman actually completes that course, then we're going to recognise the credit, give them a qualification in science from the university, and then we're going to give them a pathway into a science degree within that university. So that's our first thing. So it's breaking that barrier around access to university. Secondly, what we're doing is we're providing them with a mentoring relationship, a meaningful mentoring relationship with a woman who's who's working in Accenture, who's working in Microsoft, uh, or who's working in any other in, in other uh, industries across Ireland. And that's building that social capital. So they're gaining a real insight into the community. Then they're going to be visiting industry. So they're going to be taking part in the STEMS program in, in the industries that we're working with. But finally, more importantly, is we're going to be, we're building a, a digital platform where which will align all the STEM activities across Ireland, accredit them and provide access for young women to um, internships, to STEM programs, to um, mentors and to information. So what we're hoping and then finally, the STEM passport, the digital platform will include uh, a longitudinal research model where we'll be able to recognize and understand how girls are doing, what are the what are the things that work, what don't work, and how can we improve our interventions along the way. So just finally, the STEM passport aims to align all the STEM activities that are on offer, accredit them so that girls have a pathway into college or university so that they don't miss out on the matriculation requirements. And then finally, assess and build a profile of girls' college and career decisions through the platform, identifying factors which support STEM progression, but also get in the way.
I know I went over time. The last thing I'm just going to finish on, and it's really important just to finish on this, Gemma, is that I our work isn't always about the pipeline. What genuinely, for me, what's really important is that science, technology, and engineering maths are really a closed window for young women who are working class. They do not know that they can participate and they can be successful. And then the capabilities approach, actually, for me, it's about opening the door, opening the window and saying, look, these are, this is meaningful. You can do this. And hopefully they'll take the path. But if they don't, at least they've been provided with the opportunity to see science, to see technology, digitalization as a future for them. That's me. Thank you. It's brilliant, Katrina. And absolutely, I listen to you all day. It, it, <laughs> It's so good to hear about this work and, and absolutely the importance of intersectionality and in particular here class and gender and how it intersects and in digitalization. Um, I, I love the quote that you use that genius is evenly distributed by class, race and gender, but opportunity and access are not. So, um, so that's brilliant. So we have some time for uh, questions and um, you've already got big claps really interesting in the chats there. So but people are welcome to write any questions in the chat. Raise your hand if you'd like to uh, ask your question in person um, and I will call on you. So I might start if that's OK, uh, Katrina. That the initiative that you outlined, that STEM passport, um, what do you think is the most important part of it? Because, I mean, obviously all of it is is uh, tackling the three um, types of capital that you mentioned. But from your point of view, particularly if a member state was looking at this and, and wanting to get involved and know more about it. Um, I think the, the really uh, interest... So the, the idea of having everything streamlined on the platform, Gemma, for me is really, really important. I, I think we all know that role models and skills and, you know, le, you know, plug in the pipeline at specific areas and policies are and they're all equally important. But what having everything together like being able to profile young women at a young age through the passport having them complete service understanding what they know what they don't know and then being able to move them around you know refer them to places and understand their journey I think that's really valuable but also the platform is linking with industry and so there are a lot of working class girls who don't want to go to university it's not valuable to them and so with industry linked what can happen is industry can recruit for diversity through the platform and that's what makes me excited is that you know as a young woman myself from that community university was not an option people laughed at me to go to university so if for example there are young women who want to work in stem but they don't want to go they can actually be you know touted but also industry can use the platform to diversify so if we have a platform which is full of these women who are really excellent and motivated and informed this can be used as a means of making sure that quotas are met within industry so i i think the platform and the fact that we're trying to make it national really is um is the is the thing that should be considered um for the future absolutely and like you say doing a pilot with um the ability to scale it up nationally and and from that intersectionality is a term that we we all hear it's very hard to understand exactly what that means and you gave an excellent um description of it how can we do this better do you think I oh I think I think first of all naming naming this mm -hmm. I think you know we have to recognize that women any any woman that is generally successful and this is not to undermine anybody but any we we've all struggled to get through in some way or the other but actually naming the fact that there are specific challenges to specific groups is really really important I think we're afraid to have these conversations because there's but everything should have a recognition that there are different layer, layers of disadvantage or different layers of challenge. And so I think naming that and then actually having policies around that, but also just having conversations around it. Like I am free to talk about my own, where I come from as a woman and the difficulties that I had, but I, it's very rare that you hear that conversation happening because people are either ashamed that they're middle class 
or that they don't have barriers or else they don't want to say it because they think it will make people uncomfortable. So I think there's name in name in the conversation, but also then really meaningfully trying to understand there is a lot about there's a lot about race in the US, which is fantastic. But I, I personally think that wealth and class is an equalizer because when people have wealth and they have higher class they can navigate the darkness and the difficulties of the system because they have the resources so for me the conversation about class is really important absolutely and i see a raised hand there alpha i might call on you um hi katrina can you hear hi. me okay yeah hi, from a, a fellow colleague in Manus. Um, I, I just a question that came something that came up in the earlier session today about cultural fit and, and the recruitment into industry and how that's often important. Is that something do you think you might be able to that, that comes up in this project or something you've come up against? Yeah, definitely. And actually, um, when you uh, in the conversation earlier, so Accenture, I, we work with Accenture and Accenture uh, providing the mentors uh, or uh, you know helping with getting mentors and the idea so yeah cultural fit there's two things for me first of all we need to flip the idea of equity and move it away from challenge a uh, charity and the idea that like women we need to fit i i have problem with that actually i know that me as a as a working class woman brings with me a voice and an understanding and a value to an industry that doesn't necessarily always get heard because we don't make our way there so i think there needs to be conversations around fit and why someone needs to fit and and how actual diversity adds to the value of industries in in ways that cannot be foreseen unless you're willing to change the other thing I'll say to you is that it's a very difficult, it's very difficult, even in, when we were working with Accenture and they'd be fine to say, um, Amy was very much like, I don't know if we have women like this <laughs> in our industry, you know, how do we, how do we have conversations like this? How do we know it, you know, these people? And I think that's very interesting because it goes to show that this is very unconscious and very hidden. So I do think there is also responsibility for industry to think about that. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. And actually, I think it probably comes up in academic recruitment as well, but that's oh, for another, another day. 100%, 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Alpha. And, and thank you, Katrina. Um, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And this is an area that the Standing Working Group really wants to spend a bit more time on as well. Intersectionality comes up in every conversation that we have. So I'm conscious of time, um, but absolutely thank you so much, Katrina. We're absolutely honoured to have you here and uh, to have your insights and your contribution and um, to, to contribute to the discussion paper. So um, all the very best. Thank you. Brilliant presentation. Uh, and thank you. It's, it's excellent talk is what I'm seeing in the chat there. So thank you. Great. We might get started again. So hopefully you got a chance uh, to have a quick break. So welcome back. We're moving now into examples of good practice and policies and initiatives from the member states. And we're delighted to have two countries presenting today, Sweden and Norway. So we'll start with our first country, Sweden. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Sofia Evarsson, who is the Programme Director of Venova from Sweden's Innovation Agency. The title of her talk is how do we promote gender equality in the innovation system? Sophia is a program director uh, for gender and diversity for innovation at Innovo in Innovova and has been a researcher and teacher in gender studies, gender and leadership, sexual harassment, gender and armed conflict, gender and innovation, and also a gender expert in Horizon 2020. And the EU Commission's Gender Expert Group for Horizon Europe's Gendered Innovation Platform. So you're very welcome, Sophia. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let me see here if I can find the presentation. Can you see uh, the presentation and can you hear me? I can see your presentation and I can hear you. You're good to go. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation and thank you for the very interesting presentations uh, today. Uh, yes, I'm representing uh, Vinova, the Swedish uh, Innovation Agency, a government agency under the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation. Uh, we're a research and innovation funding agency and also the National Contact Authority for EU Framework Programme. And we're also the Swedish government's expert authority in innovation policy. Uh, I was looking at the objects of this webinar as a point of departure for my presentation. And, and uh, when I saw the, the, the first one, uh, the National Funding Agency's approach to support inclusion of gender dimension, I, I thought that, OK, I can start just to present uh, how we are working with gender mainstreaming. Since 2015, we have a governmental assignment to gender mainstream uh, our research and funding uh, uh, process and our entire organization. And we have done that by focusing on, on three areas. Who? Who gets our money? What? What do we finance? And how? How do we assess applications? And who are the evaluators? And our aim within the, this focus areas uh, is that fundings should be distributed equally between uh, women and men applicants, and that our funding projects should contribute to gender equality, and that an equal number of women and men, men evaluate uh, uh, incoming applications. We have also integrated gender assessment criteria into our main assessment criteria. So the, the who, what and how uh, focus areas are related to our uh, assessment criteria. So who is about uh, evaluating the actors applying for funding? And then we look at how well the project team is composed with regard to gender balance, but on, not only uh, about the quant quantitative perspective, but also how the, the resources, the power and the influence in the project team is distributed between women and men. And the what focus area is about uh, related to the potential cr criteria and the evaluators have to then evaluate the project's potential to contribute to increased uh, gender equality. Now there is an automatic uh, uh, watering of flowers <laughs> that went on. I hope you still can hear me. That is not too much noise. Uh, the how focus area is related to the uh, assessment criteria of implementation and, and, and uh, uh, it's about assessing how well these gender aspects have been integrated into uh, the project plan. So that, that was a, a short presentation of our gender mainstreaming strategy that concerns all our programs and all our calls. But then we also have a, a more strategic uh, um, initiatives that we have been working with. Uh, and I'm going to present two of them. One is uh, about AI, but AI in a slightly different way. Uh, we're looking at how AI can promote uh, gender equality. Uh, it's focusing on how AI-based system can be applied in order to increase gender equality. We know uh, a lot about the problems with applying AI and, and the, the risks of biases and, and reinforcing gender inequality when applying AI in different areas. Uh, and, and it was also presented in the discussion paper for this webinar. 
Uh, we have a lot of examples of this now, but we wanted to take another approach uh, with this initiative, uh, looking more at how a AI could be part of solutions to pressing social needs uh, related to gender inequality and related to both the Swedish gender equality goals and, and the United Nations framework. So these are the topics or the focus areas that we have been working with. Uh, and what we want to do um, is to invest in projects that apply AI that addresses gender equality challenges. And we have done a lot of different things uh, in this initiative, but one of the interesting things that we did was a hackathon uh, that we arranged to provide a platform for actors uh, that could meet and build teams and then create ideas because we wanted to see uh, the, the potential for commercial ideas uh, applying AI to solve gender inequality challenges. And this hackathon uh, gathered uh, 70 participants from 19 countries and three finalists received tailor-made support. And some of the results from this hackathon has provided us with an AI portfolio related to gender inequality challenges, uh, for example, in the area of economy. We have financed projects that work with uh, gender equal algorithms to support gender equal financing de decisions in Swedish banks. Another one works with uh, algorithms to support gender equal salary settings in order to decrease the gender pay gap. And yet another one works with AI as a tool to support gender equal pension decisions. Uh, another strategic in initiative that I wanted to present, it's in line with uh, uh, what Catriona uh, were speaking about, the leaking pipeline uh, in STEM. This is called Innovate Passion. Uh, but this is, uh, we, we uh, look at the leaking pipeline a bit uh, before the entry level. So we were targeting young girls uh, that are not even interested in, 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 in STEM, in STEM educational or vocational choices, which is very common in Sweden that uh, girls, young women, they show lack of interest. In, in STEM education, in tech and in vocational choices. So we'll, what we wanted to do with this um, innovate passion was a change in mindset. Instead of trying to draw young women into STEM areas, we uh, uh, took tech experts uh, and, and business experts into the areas where young girls are uh, engaging in their passions. So we financed uh, 13 regional Innovate Passion events in Sweden, gathering young girls where they worked with innovative solution on problems that uh, were meaningful to them, that related to their passions. And then with the assistance of, assistance of, of tech experts. So the girls were in charge and the, they were the experts on the problems that needed technical solutions. And from these regional innovation passion events, uh, three finalists from each regional event were selected and their ideas were sent into Vinova and Vinova arranged a final Innovate Passion event in Stockholm where, where all the regional uh, finalists were gathered and then three finalists were selected by a jury. It was very much in the setting or the format of the Eurovision Song Contest, except that we had three winners who received further fundings. And this initiative generated hundreds of different uh, kinds of ideas from these young women's uh, passion. And uh, in one area, it resulted in the formation of uh, a horse tech community 
where we now see that many women-led startups are uh, uh, commercializing their uh, ideas. So, uh, in sum, uh, Vinova work both with a general uh, gender mainstreaming approach in, in all our calls and programs, as well as different kind of strategic uh, initiatives, as, such as AI to promote gender equality and in, innovate passion. Uh, and I think that I, what I would like to emphasize here is um, both the dean of, of innovative approaches to these uh, challenges that we see in, in, uh, in gender and, and digitalization, a change in mindset uh, and also the importance of, of changing um, norms and challenging the norms. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Sophia. It, it's very interesting to hear about this work and um, particularly clear your focus on the who, the why, uh, sorry, the who, what and how, um, and then the hackathon and the innovate passion of fantastic ideas. So we'll open it to the floor if anybody has any questions. Uh, again, feel free to write in the chat or raise your hand if you'd like to ask your uh, question directly. I might start off and um, Sophia, so these initiatives that you were talking about, how, how have you evaluated them to see the impact that they've had? We have uh, made a different kind of, uh, of uh, evaluation, both uh, internally, uh, but for example, with this Innovate Passion um, initiative, we see that the majority or, or uh, around 40% uh, percent at least of, of these young girls, they have continued their interest in tech related to their passion and, and uh, about 25% of them have actually, and they have never had their own startup or business before, but they uh, uh, started their uh, business and their startup with this initiative and they are still uh, working with them with these uh, with these businesses, so so we see that uh, um, it it was their first meeting with both tech and with uh, starting your own business that was quite successful. Uh, we also evaluated um, our own internal work, for example, the amount of projects. Uh, uh, or applicants uh, answering yes to the question if their uh, project contribute to uh, gender equality and the evaluation of these answers uh, also show that uh, more than 60% of the applicants can see a relation and, and see that um, uh, applying a gender lens or gender analysis to their initial idea or project even if it's not focused on, on gender equality issues uh, at first, they see the relevance of, uh, of, of these aspects and then they add it to their original plan or their original project. So we see that it increases the quality of, of uh, the projects and the applications. Absolutely. And as you say, the importance of including gender in the research content is um, a, a big focus and particularly for Horizon Europe going forward and um, one being led by research funding agencies um, and uh, funders like, your, like yourself. The knock on effects, what do you think they will have generated from that, particularly having an organization like your yourself, who's very visibly working in this um, field and, and putting emphasis and importance on it? Sorry, what was your question there? I saw there was something coming up in the chat. So No worries. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, my, my question is really, what are the knock on effects that have been generated? And the question in the chat is, do you think they will bring other girls along with them? So it, it, it's a similar type question. What what do you think will happen after? Yes, I, I think that uh, they will bring other girls and, and they did so in, in these events. Um, 
what we have try, tried to do with this Innovate Passion event uh, is also to engage uh, uh, the educational system in order to change also. As we say, I think that one of our main approaches to uh, all of the things that we are doing is the challenging of the norms rather than trying to get women into what is already existing uh, we try to uh, use their influence and their power uh, uh, to uh, change the system to change the edu educational curricula to uh, uh, to change uh, or and and find new vocational areas for example which we saw was happening in in uh, in the innovate uh, passion uh, initiative so yes i'm quite uh, uh, confident that this will get uh, uh, other girls or young women into uh, the same path but i think it's about what what Kationa also say what is needed to make tech and digitalization meaningful for young girls uh, and I think that is what we have been focusing on and, and we can show a lot of examples that that um, educational systems can can uh, uh, use to change their curricula and, and their mindset about uh, where tech, tech and STEM is applicable. Absolutely. And again, this is an area that we could talk about um, at length, but conscious of time and your own, Sophia, thank you so much. We're really appreciative of you taking the time to share your insights with us. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move now to our next country case study, uh, which is Norway. And we actually have two speakers. So I'm delighted to introduce uh, Linda Marie Rustad, who is the director of Kilden the Gender Research .no. and then Trina Rog Korsvik, who is a senior advisor of the Kilden Research .no. And the title of the talk is What Do We Know About AI's Impact on Gender Equality? Learning Experiences from a Norwegian Project. So I'll just do a brief introduction. Um, Linda has an MA in philosophy on feminist theory of science from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She's very actively in, engaged in Nordic, European and international cooperation on gender research and gender equality in research. She's worked as a researcher lecturer at the Centre for Gender Research at the University of Oslo in Norway and has written several articles in feminist theory and has headed up the Secretariat for the Norwegian Committee for Gender Balance and Diversity in Research and worked in the Norwegian Development Cooperation Agency where she was responsible for integrating gender equality into a program for capacity building of research institutions in the Global South. She's the co-author of Booklets, Talent at Stake, Gender Sensitive Leadership and What is the Gender Dimension in Research and is a member of the European Commission's expert group, Gendered Innovation 2, and uh, also a member of the former Helsinki group and has been participating in the EU projects such as GenderNet and the uh, Gender Equality Academy. So Trina holds a PhD in history, specialised in the history of feminism and women's movements. She has experience from European research cooperation on gender related issues and has been a researcher and lecturer at the Centre for Gender Research at the University of Oslo. She's been running the Kilden Initiated Project Integrating the Gender Dimension in Research and presenting best practices from a variety of scientific fields and is managing Kilden's Women's History Project. She's published numerous articles and books on gender related topics and um, is also involved in the SWAFTS project, the Gender Equality Academy, and also the booklets, What is Gender Dimension and Research with Linda. So Linda and Trina, you're very, very welcome. I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind um, introduction. Uh, and I think also Jenny is supposed to share uh, the PowerPoint presentation. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so 
thank you for inviting us and also thank you to Patricia, uh, Katarina and also Sofia for interesting presentations. Um, so I, uh, next slides please. Thank you. Uh, just a short introduction who uh, we are. Hilden Gender Research, NO is a national knowledge center for gender perspectives and gender balance in research. We disseminate and promote research on gender and we function as a hub for gender researchers and all others interested in research on gender and equality. Hilden is organized as an independent department of the Research Council of Norway. So we disseminate and communicate research on gender in Norway and internationally. We run an independent news magazine and the scientific journal of gender research. We organize seminars and debates among researchers. Uh, we invite civil society and also policymakers. We run, uh, we develop and run websites uh, for uh, on assignment from other authorities, such as gender.no, and we make reports and literature reviews on uh, a specific topic, such as gender equality and AI. And finally, as also mentioned in the introduction, we are involved in several EU projects. So today we have been invited to talk about one of our reports published last year, about the impact of artificial intelligence and digitalization on gender equality. The aim of today's workshop is to learn from each other. So I will thus focus this presentation not on IA systems um, itself, but on how we worked in collaboration with experts and stakeholders to make the report, what do we know about artificial intelligence and gender equality, a review on Norwegian research. My colleague Trine will then say something about the results of this study. Next slide, please. This report was prepared by Hilden in collaboration with the Norwegian Equality and Anti-Discrimination Ombud. The report is a literature review that presents the state of the art of Norwegian research on artificial intelligence that includes gender and gender equality perspectives. In Norway, as in other countries, the aim is to increase the use of artificial intelligence technology. In strategies to implement uh, artificial intelligence, many opportunities are highlighted, such as improving services to be more cost effective, targeted and user friendly. Artificial intelligence is even seen as a means to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. Norway is one of the most digitalized countries in the world and in 2020 the Norwegian government issued this national strategy of artificial intelligence. The government's political objectives is to increase the use of artificial intelligence systems to maintain and develop national competitiveness as well as welfare standards. Artificial intelligence is also seen as a means to streamline streamline public administrative bodies and make them more effective. However, as many of you are familiar with, it has been demonstrated that artificial intelligence may have discriminatory effects. The Norwegian government strategy on artificial intelligence recognizes this problem. Based on the work of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence set up by the European Commission, the Norwegian strategy lists a set of ethical principles for trustworthy artificial intelligence. And one of the main principles uh, is that artificial intelligence systems shall facilitate inclusion, diversity and equal treatment. It also states that when developing and using artificial intelligence, it is particularly important to make sure that artificial intelligence helps to increase inclusion and equality and avoid discrimination. Nevertheless, 
we have found few concrete examples of how this ideal of artificial intelligence is to be realized in practice and concrete policies. This is one of the reasons why we saw the need for an up-to-date overview of scientific research about the impact of artificial intelligence and digitalization on gender equality in a national context. Next slides, please. One way of raising awareness of the importance to have a gender perspective when implementing artificial intelligence is to make a literature review, which emphasize what we know and what the knowledge gaps are. Hence, the aim of producing this review was twofold. We wanted to increase the awareness among stakeholders that have an impact on the development and implementation of national strategies. It was therefore important for us when we got the op uh, opportunity to collaborate with the Norwegian Equality and Anti-Discrimination Ombud, which had already put the digitalization and equality on the agenda. Secondly, we wanted to raise awareness among researchers in the artificial intelligence field who are not necessarily familiar with the gender perspectives. What we usually do when we produce such reviews is to invite a mix of researchers to workshops, where some are experts in the field in matter and some are experts in a combination of the field in matter and gender. And Trine will give you some more details about this. This is a win-win situation. It increases the quality of our work and they learn more about gender. And in the end, we hope that this will influence their research in the future. Very often the core experts are invited when policymakers need advice or input. So if they have learned something about gender by being part of our work, we couldn't be more pleased. So this um, outcome is of course uh, a bit difficult to measure. And also due to the fact that we uh, the, uh, the report was published in October, it's also a bit early to have uh, uh, to know exactly what the outcome will be. But we are sure that we this is a step to increase uh, awareness. Next slide, please. So when we started the work with the review, we were interested to know more about the following questions. What do we know about the impact of artificial intelligence on gender equality and what do we not know? Where are the knowledge gaps? Are artificially intelligent systems reproducing existing gender differences or does artificial in, uh, intelligent technology provide useful tools to achieve more equality and prevent discrimination? So now I give the floor, the screen to Trina, who is one of the authors of the review and she will present some of the findings. We can't hear you. Sorry, now you can hear me. Now we can hear you. OK, good. So uh, to ensure the quality of the work, we invited researchers specialized in robotics, artificial intelligence, digitalization of welfare and health services and of the labor market. They were not primarily gender researchers, but they were all interested in gender equality issues. The selection of the researchers uh, reflected our actually open minded approach to the topic. Some of them were techno optimists, emphasizing positive effects of artificial intelligence intelligence and some or actually most of them had a more critical stance some were also inspired by the so-called critical algorithm studies so we organized meeting with the researchers and the ombud and they read and commented the report throughout the process we had already decided to primarily map norwegian research that is scientific publications with at least one co-author affiliated with a norwegian institution and uh, to ensure the quality, the literature search was conducted in collaboration with the University of Oslo Library. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So soon we decided to organize the research literature into three thematic areas where artificial intelligence has an important impact for citizens everyday life, which is somewhat similar to the, the discussion paper, but not completely. 
that is uh, public and private services, employment, and uh, digital, digital social platforms and entertainment. Uh, these societal areas are all important in a gender equality perspective. For example, what does it mean for gender equality in the labor market that many work tasks are taken over by robots? And what does it mean that women and men are recommended different content on dig dig digital social platforms that they use in everyday life? As we expected, there wasn't much research done in Norwegian context. However, we did find relevant research results, and I will now very briefly present some of the findings. But at the same time, this we have very little time, so I recommend you to take a look at the English uh, summary that I just linked in the chat or the Norwegian whole report if you understand Scandinavian language. Uh, next slide, please. So in the review, we look at the use of AI system in public and private services, such as health and welfare services. But we also looked at how a more advanced AI system is are used in predictive analytics as a tool to prevent crime as well as to settle refugees. That is, however, not used in Norway. Uh, we wanted to find out, but in Britain, uh, and it's very controversial. <laughs> we wanted to find out what the research can tell us about which groups are included or excluded when AI technology is developed, tested and implemented in society, and whether it has consequences for gender equality and social inequality. For instance, does AI reinforce social differences, prejudices and stereotypes, or can it help to strengthen the principle of equal treatment of individuals in, for instance, processing systems in the welfare sector? To take an example from uh, Norwegian welfare services where automated processing systems are already in use to, uh, to calculate clients' financial support. That is not the case in many other countries, but it is in Norway. According to the research we have identified, there is an emergent digital divide between those who master digital systems and those who do not. The result is that some clients don't receive the benefits to which they are entitled. When checked for gender, however, it seemed that age and education level are much more important. Thus, elderly people with little education are more vulnerable to digitalization, regardless of gender. So even our point of departure was to look at gender equality. We saw that sometimes other factors, such as social class, as you mentioned earlier, and age are more important than gender. So next slide, please. Uh, employment. Regarding la the labor market, we looked at employment polarization that refers to larger economic differences between salaries, but also larger social differences between those who have permanent jobs and those who have not. Some make their living in the so-called platform economy or gig economy, of which Uber is a well-known example. From other research, we know that women are generally more vulnerable to insecure uh, job situations, as it has been mentioned here several times, when they have care responsibilities for children or sick relatives. We also found that typical male-dominated manual occupations in industrial sectors and transport are most threatened by being replaced by robots. On the other hand, many typical women-dominated service jobs such as office workers and secretaries, have already disappeared due to digitalization in Norway. In addition, we looked at how working conditions are affected by the digital transformation, as well as the underrepresentation of women in the ICT sector. Next slide, please. We are running out of time. <laughs> when it comes to AI in digital social platforms and entertainment, one of the main findings was that many people in Norway don't know very little about what algorithms are. The lack of knowledge correlates with gender, age, educational level and geography. Generally, women report to know less about algorithms than men. A large proportion of women, especially the elderly and the less educated, again, report to have no understanding of algorithms at all. On the other hand, men with higher education living in urban areas most often report that they have a solid understanding of algorithms and are mostly also critical towards them, I can add. As algorithms are increasingly governing internet, uh, internet search, information access and digital platform participation, the divide is of course a democratic problem. Another finding was that algorithmic recommendation system may be at risk of reproducing stereotypical gender roles 
And uh, third, finding regards research about sexual harassment of girls and women on digital uh, social platforms, including online computer games. That is quite that is quite known also from the, the paper discussion paper. But to conclude, our literature review suggests that for AI based technology to have the positive social effects many observers anticipate, more research is needed about how the technology affects gender equality. Generally speaking, our review indicates that there is a need for additional interdisciplinary research and development of methodologies to get better knowledge of the effects of artificial intelligence on gender equality. So now I give the floor back to my colleague Linda, who will say something about the outcome <laughs> of the work. Thank you, Trina. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's see. The conclusion from our work uh, are relevance for policymakers. So the finding that Trina refers to is, of course, uh, important for policymakers and those who are responsible for implementing the strategies to know. It is, for example, important for them to know that women know less about algorithms than men and that artificial intelligence technologies may have discriminatory effects. And as Trina also pointed out, and I think also Patricia earlier uh, very clearly showed, there is a need for more interdisciplinary research. Lastly, what happened next with, uh, with our literature review? Hilden has established new contacts and networks across the research sector and with researchers within fields that up to now haven't been familiar with gender perspectives or considering consequences for gender equality. The review was presented at the Equality and Anti-Discrimination Ombuds Annual National Conference in October 2020, and now the Ombud prepares a policy brief based on the literature review. We have been invited at Norwegian National Broadcast Radio Program, and we are also invited to talk about artificial intelligence and gender equality to a workshop of the women's section of the Center Party, a political party which is believed to be a part of the winning team when we have national election this fall. Next slide, please. I will end this talk with showing you a picture of Augusta Ada King, uh, Countess of Lovelace. She, uh, she died in uh, 1852 and she has uh, she is known for the one who actually created the first uh, algorithm. She was a mathematician and also she was the daughter of the famous Lord Byron. So I think this was a nice way of ending our talk. I will also encourage you to follow us on the social media and also to contact us if you need and are interested in more information. So thanks again for inviting us. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Linda and uh, Trina. Um, it, it, it's really interesting work and I'd like to thank you for the, the links that you've put into the chat um, for everybody to access as well. Um, we are running slightly over time, but if, it, if you were um, able to stay for a couple of questions, we can keep recording and um, participants um, can access it afterwards. It's up to yourselves. Well, we are here. <laughs> You're here. Very good. Excellent. Well, if anybody has some questions, uh, and I think I see one here um, that I can ask, um, and also feel free to put up your hand. So in your paper, you talk about the ownership of the data which informs AI algorithms and the secrecy on the part of the larger companies. Have you any suggestions on how we can encourage these companies to be more open and transparent? <laughs> yeah. are, are that, is that for me or? <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> uh, I think that's actually in, uh, I was, I'm not an expert in AI at all. I'm an historian, you know, so, so I just basically read on the, the research that was done in a Norwegian context. But one thing that is sure that is that um, in Norway, the, there is a lot of more uh, regulations on the, for instance, the personal data and so on that than in, for instance, Ireland. So, you know, we could not 
uh, we have something called uh, data tilsynet that is really strict on what uh, people can do and you know to share like this kind of app for uh, finding um, people with COVID-19 that was actually forbidden in Norway and such because it's much much more protected on on personal um, data so um, I think that's not the qu question there because that is more how to, they like Google or uh, are making their algorithm algorithms how they they are collecting the data and that is really an international problem so that I, I think it's uh, very necessary that the, I know the EU uh, has policies on this but uh, as long as the United States and China and so on they don't agree to be in this it's a problem definitely a problem so Sorry, I can give you a better answer. No, that's quite OK. That's why we're here. Um, it, it, it's absolutely the point um, to kind of do this mutual learning and, and mm. share so it, it can help as well. And um, do you see any possible um, positive mm. synergy effects um, from conducting such a review? Uh, I can answer to that. I think what is, has been, uh, think has been interesting is the cooperation also with um, uh, the ombud in Norway, because they were interested in digitalization and discrimination, and to collect the research, you know, the state of the art research in Norway, and uh, it could feed into their policy brief, which they are uh, producing. It's been delayed due to the COVID-19, but but that is also to, to in a way. Um, making a baseline or to, to create a knowledge base for policy. So, so of course, Hilden, we are we are making knowledge, we synthesize knowledge and research on gender, and of, and the, and Ombud has a different role in the Norwegian society. So, I think this mix to how to meet the research base with politicians, and in that. In, in, uh, in that kind of meeting uh, to make a literature review could be a starting point for that kind of discussions. So I think it's been very, because there are a lot of, um, you know, hypotheses and think uh, you know what you know in a way, but to map the, the, um, the whole, the, the, the knowledge field, you get a, a, a better grip on what this is uh, about. So I think this is, has been a very interesting um, cooperation. Absolutely. And and did you see any research pointing towards AI technologies being beneficial for gender equality? Uh, <laughs> not very much as to admit, but uh, uh, we, we had one of the, the guys who were uh, collaborating with us, who is specialized in AI technology. He was very optimistic and thought it could be used as a tool. And then, he, but then he was mostly referring to uh, in uh, research from the US that you know that you can have an artificial intelligence system that uh, discovers that sexism is on the internet and so on uh, but uh, the it was I, I would say that most most of the um, research is rather critical and uh, uh, like uh, Katarina Katruna <laughs> also mentioned I think that uh, I, I think that in Norway it's actually more maybe more accepted to have like a, some kind of class uh, perspective also on on the um, on the on the research, uh, for instance, that I didn't talk about that, uh, for instance, that how the artificial intelligence system uh, can be used to control the, the workers in the working place, and uh, that the bosses get more power to to uh, yeah more power to the bosses, and uh, so that was kind of, that is quite a lot of um, uh, there is lo quite a lot of research in this area, but not so much with a gender perspective. So it was actually easier to find research with a, some kind of class perspective than with a gender perspective. So uh, yeah. I wouldn't say it's it, uh, intersectional because it doesn't take all the kind of uh, variables into account. But um, yeah, but that was qu that's a, quite a lot of research on the welfare sector and the and also the the employment labor market with a very critical <laughs> stance. Fair enough. And I see one hand raised there. We might take as a last question with Sophia. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think that is why we, for example, as a funding agency, uh, um, could actually uh, contribute to and support uh, the positive sides of technology and we, where we actually should go in and, and finance and support uh, um, 
applications of AI when it can be beneficial for gender equality, just to show another side of uh, uh, this uh, problem that we all know about. So, so I just wanted to say our work show that it, it is possible <laughs> to yeah. see also uh, benefits from these uh, emerging technologies. Thank yes, you. But, but Thank you, really and I have to leave. Because I think Sweden is like more innovative country than Norway, so <laughs> we can look to Sweden to see more uh, research on the positive effects as well. Absolutely. So many thanks for that, Linda and uh, Trina. I know people are, are having to go, so it, yeah, it's me too. I'm going to, to another meeting. But absolutely. thank you for thank you for inviting us. Oh, you're more than welcome. We're absolutely delighted to have you um, uh, taking the time to share your insights uh, and expertise with us. So I will close this final session and I'd like to thank all of our speakers, um, Marcella, Maria, um, Patricia, uh, uh, Katrina, um, Sophia, Linda and Trina. And we're going to take away all of these excellent contributions and inputs that have been recorded today and also from our two previous sessions. And we'll use them to update our discussion paper and also to identify key recommendations for the standing working group to consider. So I'd also like to thank the members of the ERIC standing working group on gender and uh, digitalization for all of their work and helping to put this session together. And also my colleagues, Jenny Rothwell and Sam Blankensy for their technical supports and helping to make this happen. And thank you to yourselves, our attendees, for taking the time to join us here today and for the uh, first and the second session to talk about this important area of research and innovation. It's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you everybody and stay safe.